The following presentation was recorded live by Voices from Jerusalem. I'm just going to do a little of the modern history of Israel, which is the basic major events. Obviously, there's much more that can be said. We just don't have the time to get into it. And then I want to summarize, which is very, very important. Okay, the lead up. We've talked about everything, all the different factors that go into the creation of the state of Israel. We mentioned, you know, the British being in control from 1918 until through 1948 when they finally pull out in May. After World War II, it took six million Jews dying, but the world felt bad enough for the Jews to finally decide to help us maybe actualize our national aspirations. I don't believe that would have happened if not for the Holocaust, unfortunately. But even though even after the war was over, it doesn't mean the British decided to let free immigration into Israel. It's an excellent movie, which won an Academy Award, I think, a year ago or two years ago, called The Long Road Home or Back, I'm not sure, which talks about the story of Jews trying to get back to the land of Israel, which is a very difficult thing. We're talking about those survivors of the Holocaust, who many who went back to Eastern Europe and found themselves they were murdered. There was pogroms in Poland where Jews were killed after the war. So Jews were trying to get to Israel. Obviously, those Jews who stayed realized there was no future for Jews in, in Europe. Okay. I think it's uh, I think Dennis Prager who says it beautifully. One of the great lessons of the Holocaust, you know, he says, before you can ask where was God, you have to ask where was man. And one of the final lessons of the Holocaust is the failure of modern enlightened culture to create a better world. And it certainly should have shown the Jews beyond any doubt that there's no future for the Jews living in such a world. I know that's a sad statement for all those Jews who wanted to be incorporated into European civilization, but even the most enlightened society in the world, Germany, look what it did. So Jews were trying to get back to the land of Israel. The British, who are still openly siding with the Arabs, kept the, this policy of restricting Jewish immigration in place. And you have a huge attempt of Jews to get into the land of Israel, illegally running the British blockade. Most famous is, of course, July 1947, the Exodus. This totally packed ship which tried to run the blockade, which is captured. You've seen the movie Exodus, right? You know, very powerful story, one of many attempts. And by the way, Jews who were captured who were caught by the British, would be stuck in places like Atlit. Atlit is on the coast of Israel, north of Tel Aviv. It was an internment camp, and I've been there. It's very scary. If you consider, if you've ever been to a concentration camp in Europe, it's got the barbed wire and the barracks and the guard towers. Can you imagine surviving Auschwitz and trying to escape into Israel a year after the Holocaust is over and being captured by the British and then being marched into a camp with guard towers and dogs and then being marched into a giant shower facility, which with this one, thank God, the British weren't trying to exterminate the Jews. But I can't imagine the absolute panic that people must have gone through knowing they're being marched to this giant shower room like the, that happened in uh, Germany. Eventually, the British realize in, uh, within a couple of years after the end of World War II, they cannot control the situation. Most of the Jews who are trying to get in are getting in. The situation is getting out of control. The British have 100,000 soldiers and policemen in the land of Israel trying to keep the peace here. It's incredible. There's only 600,000 Jews in the country. And it just goes to show you, when the Jews don't want to be controlled, you can't control them. Okay, it's interesting. The British had the same 100,000 police and soldiers trying to keep the peace in India. Now, India had a little bit larger population by several hundred million, and they needed the same number of people to control the Jews as to control the entire India, the country of India. It kind of reminds us of the Bar Kokhba uprising, when the Romans had 12 of like 28 legions in the land of Israel. Like half the Roman army had to be in the land of Israel to control the Jews. Eventually, they throw the whole thing off the United Nations. And I want to read. It's, uh, this is British government statement, February 18, 1947. This is from Conor Cruz O'Brien's book, The Siege. His Majesty's government have of themselves no power under the terms of the mandate to award, to award the country to the Arabs or the Jews, or even to partition it between them. We have therefore reached the conclusion that the only course open to us is to submit the problem to the judgment of the United Nations. On November 29, 1947, the United Nations in Flushing Meadow, in the famous vote, votes 33 to 13, you can still hear the radio broadcast, to partition Israel to allow 150,000 Jews into the land of Israel and to partition into separate Jewish and separate Arab-Palestinian parts. Now, it's very important to realize the Jews accepted it. Their policy, the official you know, the Jewish agency policy, which was the sort of recognized authority in Israel, we will take whatever we can get. The Arabs rejected it. They rejected any Jewish presence in the land of Israel. Now, the important thing to remember is if the Arabs had said, okay, There'd be no Palestinian question. There'd be no, 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 it'd all be fine. It'd have been settled. That would have been it. Okay, everyone got a piece of real estate, but they rejected it. Very important to keep in mind. From that period of time onward, the British prepared to move themselves out of the land of Israel. And the situation, the situation here gets very, very bad. The British more or less turned their backs on the situation. Jews who are greatly outnumbered in the land suffer tremendously from terrorist attacks in the land of Israel. 
there's all kinds of convoys ambushed and bombs going off. Ben Yehuda Street, there's a huge bomb. The Jewish agency building is blown up. There's also Jewish reprisals. You have Arabs slaughtering Jews in Haifa, the oil refinery, you name it. It was, it was very, very bloody. If you want to get Martin Gilbert's historical atlas of the Jewish people, he has a couple of maps that show you dates and places of different major events. Probably the, one of the worst ones is in um, April 13, 1948. There's a convoy, Hadassah Hospital, the one on Mount Scopus, which was an enclave, like kind of Berlin is, over inside communist territory. There, the, it was an enclave, a Jewish-held enclave, which they would send up busloads of, of uh, doctors and stuff to replace the doctors up there. On Jul- April 13, 1948, a convoy was ambushed with like 70 doctors and nurses in it. And there was a, there was a, it was a seven-hour shootout. They were shooting at these vehicles. The whole thing happens within 200 yards of a British police station. Eventually, everyone's killed. They kill all the doctors and the nurses. They mutilate all the bodies. The British do nothing. This was basically the situation. You take the road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem today, and you get to Bab al-Wad, which is Latrun, where you start, to, where the road gets very narrow, and then the hills start. As you go up to Jerusalem, you can still see the remains of burned-out armored cars, which were basically slopped together by the Jewish the Haganah, etc., to try and bring food and water up to Jerusalem, because during this whole period of time, Jerusalem is being blockaded. Okay, no food, no water. The calorie ration in Jerusalem in the few months preceding the, the birth of the state and right after was something like 350 calories a day which is like a bowl of cornflakes no, with no milk in it. I'm talking about near starvation. Again, the British basically doing nothing to stop it. Yes? Who was the massacre committed by? Was it Arabs living inside the state of Israel? Yeah, 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 the Arabs living inside. We'll get it to wasn't Jordanian. Well, the British, right? No, they'll come later. They'll come later and get involved. When, as soon as Israel, we get, we'll get to the Israel declaring itself a state, we'll see that everyone will join in the, the uh, attempted slaughter of, of the fledgling state of Israel. But initially, it was like the Fedayin, like the local, the local irregular Arabs, not too well organized, shooting at the Jews. And of course, it was a very, very lopsided conflict. And, Israel, and especially Jerusalem was in a very precarious situation. Um, on May 13, 1948, the day before Israel declares itself a state, the Gush Etzion block is captured by, um, by the Egyptian army. And a lot of the people who surrender are executed by the Egyptians. Okay, that's actually part of Israel in terms of territory, but this, it's under contention. There's a lot of Arabs living in there even today. Um, on May 14, 1948, at 4 p.m., the Hey ER, the 5th of ER, Israel declares itself a state. The British lower the flag, and immediately Israel raises its own flag after 2,000 years and declares itself an independent state. And you can hear the famous radio address of David Ben-Gurion from the Art Museum in Tel Aviv. I want to just read you. This is excerpts from the proclamation of the state of Israel, May 14, 1948. This is from the Jew in the Modern World. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here, the spiritual, religious, and national identity was formed. Here, they achieved independence and created a culture of national and universal significance. Here they wrote and gave the Bible to the world. Exiled from Palestine, the Jewish people remained faithful to it in all the countries of the dispersion, never ceasing to pray and hope for their return and restoration of their national freedom. Accordingly, we, the members of the National Council, met together in solemn assembly today, and by virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and of the General Assembly of the United Nations, hereby proclaim the establishment of the state of Israel in Palestine to be called Israel. State, excuse me, establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. We offer peace and enmity to all neighboring states and their peoples and invite them to cooperate with the independent Jewish nation for the common good of all. Wishful thinking, right? With trust in the rock of Israel, we set our hands to this declaration at this session of the Provisional State Council in the city of Tel Aviv on Sabbath Eve, the 5th of ER, 5708, the 14th day of May, 1948. And everyone's dancing in the streets, and immediately Egypt bombs Tel Aviv. Five Arab armies declare war. The whole world declares an arms embargo in Israel, and the state of Israel is born. Now, by the way, look at Declaration of Independence. In that little document, you see one of the big problems that confronts us today. There was a huge debate. Even though the government, the Provisional Government, overwhelmingly secular, there were those members who wanted to include God in the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it's in the one in America, for instance. And there's a lot of people who felt, in keeping with this idea of, look, forget the God stuff. That's for the, sec- that's for the religious getaways Jew of Europe. We don't need that in our Declaration. They, they debate and debate, and they came up with a compromise. They're going to put in Tzur Yisrael, the Rock of Israel. And those who want to see in that God, fine. Those who want to see in that a piece of you know, granite, whatever. <laughs> but it says, to a, to a large extent, is indicative of the very significant problem we have today in terms of Jewish secular identity of the state, Jewish state, secular democracy. You see it from the very beginning. So too, as I said before, in Hatikva, the idea of Leo Tamchoshi Batzeinu, to be a free people in our land, as opposed to my version would be Leo Tamkadosh, to be a holy people in the land of Israel. Okay, the War of Independence, May 1948 to July 1949, which was basically 45 million Arabs against 600,000 Jews, with an arms embargo. Israel having 
no heavy artillery, no tanks, no airplanes, no nothing. Okay? Five major Arab armies. We're talking about all our surrounding neighbors, plus Iraq, getting in on the situation, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, every, Transjordan at the time, everyone getting involved against little Israel. It should have been, by the way, a huge slaughter. It's one of the great miracles of modern Jewish history is that uh, little teeny Israel, and now I know modern revisionists, anti-Zionist sort of historical teachers, a big thing in the newspaper lately, they decided to rewrite the history books because this country suffers from a huge amount of guilt and self-hate. So the new textbooks they're coming out with in Israeli high schools talk about how, you know, the reality is that in every battle, the Jews had the logistic superiority and the manpower superiority. It's unbelievable. These are Jews writing about it. It's a complete denial of the miraculous nature of the 48 war. Now, granted, there's some smart Jews there, but it was a completely lopsided conflict. Completely lopsided conflict. Uh, the old city, by the way, fell to the Jordanian Legion on May 25th after holding out for two weeks. Okay, you had 250 Haganah and Palmach fighters defending about 1,500 Jewish inhabitants who surrendered in Beit Rothschild Square. Okay, and then for the next 19 years, it's going to become that building in Beit Rothschild Square, which is that, where the arch is, was the Jordanian military headquarters. Um, that's the one place we didn't do too well in. Otherwise, remarkably, from June 11th to July 9th, there was a, there was a, uh, a ceasefire announced. Israel used that time to, to stock up on arms. One of the most interesting books you can read about the War of Independence is a book by Leonard Slater called The Pledge. You want to see Jewish ingenuity. It's an unbelievable story about how all these diaspora communities in, were involved in smuggling weapons into the land of Israel. It's amazing. Even organized Jewish crime figures like Mayor Lansky, you know, he, one of the big guys. He speaks to the Italians. You know, he had a good connection with the Italians. They get the Teamsters Union in New York to make sure that any ships that had arms for Arabs did not make it there and made it to Israel instead. It's a fascinating story. It's, an, it's the pledge. It's a great, it's a great book. But anyway, after after July 9th, the fighting starts up again for another very short period of time, not like 10, 11 days. But Israel's able to not only fight off the Arabs, except in the old city, but actually gain a huge amount of territory. Because if you look at the original partition plan, if you look on your little timeline here, you can see what it looked like. If you look on the partition plan here, you see that the actual amount of land given to the Jews was impossibly small, and actually gets much, much larger. This is pre, it was actually a little teeny waste in the middle. If you look over here. And Israel is able to still get more territory, although in the middle of the country, from the Tanya to Kalkilia, it was only nine miles wide still. It was a very difficult situation. Anyway, it lasted for 13 months, the War of Independence. 6,000 Israelis died, which is 1% of the population. Now, we say 6,000 a war, but you have to appreciate 1% of the population. The Vietnam War, I think 52,000 Americans died in the Vietnam War. Take 1% of the population of America today. What do we have? We're talking about like 2.5 million Americans dying in a war. Yeah, we don't really appreciate it. Little teeny country, that's a lot of people. 6,000. Israel's costliest war. First, that's a tremendous number. We don't appreciate how large percent of the population that is. Now, a couple of different things that, again, just to very briefly talk about things we see in the modern state. First of all, I mean, we don't appreciate how amazing what's gone on in this country in 50 years is, despite the fact that it's a country made of Jews who can't get along at all, and it was founded by a bunch of Polish socialists who have no idea of how to develop an economy. You know, everything we did, we did wrong, yet look what we accomplished. This, first of all, the growth of the population. Hey, look, at, look, look at your, you have your line lines here? It's unbelievable. Look at the growth of the population here. 1948, 600,000 Jews. Eight years later, 1.1,200,000 1. 1, Jews. 1973, 8, 1, 1, Talk about the population. A little desert, nothing country surrounded by hostile Arab neighbors who only have ceasefire. No, we're not talking about peace here. You know, we're talking about a, a country that has absorbed the population of Israel has gone up since the founding of the state 750 times. That's an incredible accomplishment. You know the economic burden of absorbing Many, many more times the original population is. It's been, by the way, it's a big blessing because we know that immigration has done tremendous things for the country. And along with that, that should, that should have more than less crippled the country economically. And by the way, if you've been here for the first couple decades of the state, there was severe austerity and rationing and this. And, you know, this is the country, I've been here almost 18 years. The standard of living in this country has gone up tremendously in the last two decades. But Israel's not only able to survive living on a constant war footing with a tremendous economic burden of absorbing the population, but it grows economically amazingly. And keep in mind, by the way, that Israel is, for almost the entire period of time, surrounded by countries that are either in a state of war with it or in a state of cold peace and have had a boycott against it, which is spilled out to the rest of the world where a lot of countries would not sell things. Pepsi-Cola didn't sell in Israel Pepsi for years because of the boycott. Subaru was the only Japanese car company to sell here. 
It's an incredible thing. Think about it, that what Israel's been able to do. Today, Israel has a GMP that is greater than all the surrounding nations around it combined. It's unbelievable. Like twice as great as all the countries around Israel surround. Well, I mean, it, sorry? I mean, it doesn't surprise me because, I mean, the rest of the countries around are like... Yeah, I'm not going to get into. I'm not going to get into why. We have to appreciate not only that. In 1997, we're talking about you know there's a biblical prophecy of you know the land blooms for the Jews. That for us we can live here. Anyone else? It's going to be a desert wasteland. Jews come back despite the most hands tied behind our back. Israel did. It's incredible. 1997, the International Monetary <laughs> Fund took Israel off the list of developing countries and made it and said Israel is now a fully developed first world country. I believe it is number 18th highest standard of living in the world. Just behind that of England. And we're talking about in a state, look, with, it's unbelievable. With the wars and the terrorism and the boycott and the absorption, it's incredible. It's an incredible feat. Granted, in the manners department, I think we're still third world, but we have to appreciate it. <laughs> and to, speaking of wars, we have to appreciate the, the number of wars that Israel's been involved in. We have the War of Independence. We have the Suez Campaign, where Nasser, who was the big nationalist leader of, of, of Egypt, um, who died in 1970, embarked on the, the Suez Canal, which was built by the British. You know, he, he tried to nationalize it, more or less, take it away from the, the French and the British. And they, in a rare show of support, we made, they made an alliance with Israel. And on October 29, 1956, Israel, with British and French support, invades the Sinai and takes over the Suez Canal. And it's only because of huge pressure in the United Nations that Israel has to pull out again. But that's number one, war. Okay, we have the after the War of Independence. Then we have the Six-Day War, um, June 5th. Starting on June 5th, Egypt closes the Straits of Tehran in the Gulf of Aqaba, and that's an official act of war. Israel, in a preemptive strike, because the big problem Israel has is because such a teeny country with no strategic depth, and because it relies on a huge amount of reserves, cannot afford to have its army mobilized, because three-quarters of the Israeli army are reservists, and if they mobilize, the country grinds to a halt. So Israel can never afford to fight a protracted war. So seeing the writing on the wall, Israel, in, um, in June 5th of 19, 1967, realizing that the entire Arab world is about to attack, launches a preemptive strike, one of the most brilliant preemptive strikes in history, where they take out the entire Egyptian Air Force, and then, a day later, take out the entire Jordanian Air Force, <laughs> because the Egyptians, being the fools that they were, were broadcasting a tremendous victory. Meanwhile, they were completely crushed, and the Jordanians stupidly believed it, so their whole Air Force was caught up with their pants down also. <laughs> Of course, uh, Jordan joins in after being asked not to join in, which enables Israel to not only reconquer the West Bank, which was Jordanian-occupied territory. There's never any independent country called Palestine there, you should know. But conquer the old city. What is one of the most dramatic moments when, um, which general is it? It's Motagur. When he announces that Jerusalem has been recaptured, the words he used is Har Abayat Biadenu. Not Jerusalem is in our hand. The Temple Mount is in our hands. And you have to see the pictures. I, I, I'm afraid I didn't have time to get the accounts. But to see the pictures of all these secular Israeli soldiers at the Western Wall crying and Rabbi Shlomo Gorin blowing the shofar and people were going nuts. They couldn't believe it. Israel like tripled the territory. We've got the whole Sinai, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, the Old City, Jerusalem back in the hands of the Jewish people. And to be fair, we didn't do to the, the sites in Jerusalem what the Arabs did to us in 1948. They blew up all the synagogues looted the Jewish quarter, nothing was touched. Not a bullet hit the Dome of the Rock. Israel scrupulously, it's always, we're always being condemned for, you know, we don't respect other people's religions. It's such nonsense. But it's an amazing event. Amazing event in military history. We don't appreciate the 67 war. I actually met a, a, German, a Jewish guy who was serving, a, a, not a Jewish guy, a Gentile officer who was converting the American army. He was in Wiesbaden, Germany, about 10, 12 years ago. And he told me that in... Uh, in Fort Bragg, in New Jersey, they have a Cray supercomputer that runs military scenarios for battles. When it's not doing nuclear war, you know, since, uh, when it's not doing nuclear war scenarios, they would put an imbalance of forces for all different battles, and a supercomputer could run all kinds of computations. And they would, and he said, basically, all the battles in history, the way the computer runs the scenario is the way it happens in history. He said the one battle where the computer is never able to come up with a scenario where the side that won. The side that one historically actually wins the computer scenario is the 67 war. Every single computation, Israel always loses. <laughs> now, the big problem with the 67 war was a tremendous opportunity for the Jewish people to realize that, look, this is it, a miracle. What happened at the 67 war is a tremendous rise in Israel national esteem, a tremendous deflation of the Arab national ego, and the Jews were walking around making a fatal mistake. <laughs> By my strength and my hand, I did it. Okay, and we're going to see this big... And it's a big backlash. It's going to come about in less than you know, a decade later. Another conflict before we get to the 73 wars is the war of attrition. 
Ends the 67 war in February 1967. NASA, again, with a lot of Russian support, decides to embark on a war of attrition, which is something most people didn't know about, to bleed Israel dry. We're going to constantly fight with you guys until we bleed you out. And Israel retaliates. It gets very bloody. I have a cousin of mine who fought in a very interesting story. He was a commando with Ariel Sharon. He has some great stories that are always going on. Finally, after almost won a war with Russia, it's amazing, Israel, in uh, July 1970, they finally have a ceasefire agreement signed. And then we have the 73 war, which was uh, October 1973, which takes place during Yom Kippur, right? The, the Arabs stupidly thinking the best day to attack Israel is Yom Kippur. It was the stupidest day to attack Israel. Anyone who's here on Yom Kippur knows it's the one day when even the secular Israelis are all in synagogue. Israel, which needs to mobilize. If they had done it a week later during Sukkot, when all these Israelis were on vacation everywhere else, you'd never be able to find them. But in 73, when every Israeli is in his local synagogue, it was the easiest possible day of the entire year. Roads are empty. All Jews are home. But, in, but Israel stupidly denied the did, just in a state of denial. The Arabs would never dare to attack us after 67. We're almost overrun. The Egyptians punch huge lines, holes in the Bar Lev line along the Suez Canal. They cross in. Lots of Israelis are slaughtered. They, they punch a hole. The Syrians punch a hole in the, in the Golan Heights. And they could have gone all the way to Haifa. They stopped dead thinking this has got to be a trap. Israel's luring us in so they can cut us off. There's nothing there to stop them. Complete miracle. Now, in the end, Israel is going to go on the offensive, and after a very bloody fight, and meanwhile, the Egyptians had gotten tons of SAM missiles to shoot down Israeli fighter planes. A lot of planes were shot down. It was a very difficult war. But we, we end up surrounding the Egyptian, I think it was their ninth army. It's only because the, the third, the third army. army, excuse me, you're right. The, it's only because of tremendous pressure from the Soviet Union threatening to go to war with Israel that we annihilate the Egyptian army. We could have, Israel could have gone all the way to Damascus, it was also sorry the oil embargo though even the United yeah. States I mean that was yeah that's when the Arabs bringing the oil weapon right around this time too but um, it was a tremendous despite the fact that in reality it was a bigger victory than the sixty seven war in terms of what Israel could have done if they kept going we could have had Cairo we could have had Damascus it was tremendous no, seriously three and a half thousand Israelis died in the fighting it was tremendous deflation of the Israeli national ego we thought we were invincible. Well, for a lot of Israelis, there was a realization that, you know that issue we had the Jews and the Holocaust and lambs to the slaughter, and this is not how the modern macho Israeli fights? People realize then, this can happen to us also. Even when we're fighting, we're out one we, we easily could have lost. Easily could have lost that war. So it was a big ego deflation for the Jews. Very sobering moment for, for Israel. In my mind, it's very clearly, you know, God telling the Jews, you know, you think you did this by your might and your strength, 67? I'll show you how close you can come to being destroyed. Okay, the last war I want to look at is, of course, the war in Lebanon, which is when I came to Israel a few months before, which started in June of 1982. It was constant shelling. The PLO, which had been in Jordan, was thrown out in the early 70s. Black September moves to Lebanon, uses it as a launching base. Israel eventually goes in, clears out the PLO, and, of course, ends up getting stuck in what is a protracted struggle, which we're still stuck in until today with the security zone there. And we I don't get to the politics of that. Um, which brings down Menachem Begin's government, by the way, the first non-labor government in Israel since the founding of the state. Israel was blatant, you know, blatantly you know, leftist labor government until 1977 when Begin comes to power and resigns in 82. But, um, of course, all this time we have terrorist attacks in the land of Israel. From the very beginning, Nasser used the Fedayin to launch from Gaza attacks. It was a way of bleeding Israel slowly. You have unceasing terrorism. And I can't go into all the details, but if you look at the history of Israel, you see this bus hijacked there, Ma'alot, the school taken over and children killed, and terrorist attacks outside the land of Israel with plane hijackings. All of this stuff is part and parcel, unfortunately, of the... Uh, of the history of Israel, including the founding of the PLO in the mid-1960s. Interesting thing to keep in mind, by the way. Historical fact has a huge impact on how we understand the modern political situation. Up until the mid-1960s, the only Palestinians were the Jews. The, the, the is El Al was originally Palestine Airways. The Jerusalem Post was the Palestine Post. If you look in the movie Exodus, um, Paul Newman is the Palestinian Jew. The word Palestine, we know, comes from, as I mentioned previously, when the Romans, during Bar Kokhba in the 2nd century, want to cut the Jewish people up and destroy them by outlawing Judaism, they also want to destroy our connection to the land of Israel, so they renamed the whole country Philistia, after an extinct people called the Philistines, who disappeared way before. Okay, they're fighting at King David's time, but they're gone by the Roman Empire. The British resurrect that name, Philistia, as their, what they called the land of Israel, and those Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Arabs. The Arabs rejected the term Palestinian up until the mid-60s. We're not Palestinians, we're Arabs. They were into pan-Arab nationalism. Only the PLO finally gets onto the idea of let's create a new people and claim they have an ancient heritage in the land of Israel that goes back thousands of years. Okay, this is exactly, by the way, the most successful, in my, in my opinion, political revisionism in human history. 
was, and when I came here in the early 1980s, no Israeli politician called Palestinians Palestinians. They all called them Arabs. Then Shimon Peres started calling them Palestinians. And since we started using the term, everyone started using the term. And now you actually have people walking around believing this PLO nonsense that we're an ancient people that have been fighting with the Jews for thousands of years. It's complete rubbish. You have to keep that in mind. I'm not saying that there's people who have been living here for hundreds of years who are Arabs who way became in here a century ago. But that's a big difference from saying that their historical claim is going back thousands of years. But that Palestinian, that PLO thing, which, by the way, would be out of existence if not for <laughs> the peace process, which saved them from the verge of destruction, you know, seriously, has now become a major, you know, political force within the land of Israel, as we see with the peace process today. Okay, that's enough on the Arab Jewish stuff. Another fact we have to take into consideration as we finish up is the diaspora support for Israel, which is also very unique. It's fundamental to Jewish identity around the world, support for the state of Israel. People think it's like the 11th commandment almost. Thou shalt give to the UJA to help Israel and the Jewish National Fund. It's quite a unique relationship of, even though many Jews in the, in the diaspora don't view Israel as a refuge, they don't think they'll ever have to be there, they always like to know that it's good that it is there. And Israel has been remarkably successful as an all Jewish, just as Jews have social welfare institutions for thousands of years for anyone else, the Jewish people have been incredibly successful at mobilizing international support for the land of Israel to the point where APAC, which is the Jewish lobby in the United States, and Jews making up 2% of America, APAC, after the NRA, the National Rifle Association, is hands down the most successful lobby in America. Okay, and it's an incredible phenomenon, the ability of Jews to mobilize the support of the state. Now, APAC sorry? What does APAC stand for? Uh, American Israel something. I don't remember. Sorry? Political Action Committee. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what it is. American Israel Political Action Committee. Thank you very much. Very good. Now, of course, we, ha- we see that besides the external problems Israel has, we are still plagued by internal problems within the land of, uh, land of Israel. Forgetting the, the Jewish-Arab thing, as we've seen, we still have this major problem of Jewish state, secular, modern Hebrew state versus Jewish state. And this problem, it's interesting how it's played itself out in recent history. I talked about how a percentage of the ultra-Orthodox community has more or less rejected the state. By the way, those people who are anti-Zionist really actively is a teeny, tiny, tiny percentage, the Turia Karta, which of course get a disproportionate amount of press play because the press is very leftist in Israel and always likes to show up the religious as being parasites and anti-state, but there's a good percentage of the religious population which does not want to have much to do with the state of Israel. There is, however, an organization I mentioned before, the Aguda, which starts in Europe before World War before World War I and becomes a major force in, in the religious world in the 1920s. Now, the Aguda, which was originally fairly anti the notion of a secular, supporting a secular and Zionist entity in the land of Israel, once the state is established, gets much more actively involved. And it does have the support of some of the Gedolim, a lot of the Gedolim of, of, East, of Eastern Europe, like Chaim Ozer Grzynski, Rav Avram Mordechai Alter, the Ger Rebbe, the Chafetz Chaim. And the, the Aguda has, by the way, since entered you know, Israeli politics as a political party for many, many decades. I want to just read you. This is the Aguda Proclamation, 1947. This is from Yaffa Gan, Sands and Stars. This is a nice little book like from Jewish history, sort of like for high school students. But It says, Aguda Israel sees as a historic event the decision of the nations of the world to return us, to, to return us after 2,000 years to the portion of the Holy Land, there to establish a Jewish state and to encompass within its borders the, the banished and scattered members of our people. This historic event must bring home to every Jew the realization the Almighty has brought this about in an act of divine providence which presents us with a great task and a grave test. And a grave test. Which is probably very interesting. It's not the notion of this is the act of the devil. It's the realization, and I like the statement very much, uh, that everything happens in the world is the will of God, and this is a miracle. And the fact that the UN got together and voted 33 to 13 to allow the Jews to reestablish the state is a clear sign that we're not forcing the hand of the Gentiles anymore. So out of real politics, you have, you have since, uh, since the late 1940s that you do have a significant, significant percentage of the Orthodox world involved in Israeli politics. You also have now all these other parties, Shas, Degel, Torah, you name it, United Torah Judaism, they're all running around. More significant is, a, is an organization which is much more pro-Zionist, which is called the Mizrahi Movement. And the Mizrahi Movement, we call the religious, the Nit Kippah guys. Um, the, the founding mentor of the Mizrahi Movement is uh, Rabbi Isaac Jacob Reins, R-E-I-N-E-S, uh, 1839 to 1915, a Lithuanian rabbi, who founded this religious Zionist movement. And uh, the idea is that this is more than just to passively support, but this is like the will of God. This is part of the redemptive process. Okay, they viewed the founding of the state as the reshitz michat v'lotenu, the sproutings of the beginning of the redemption, okay, which is not an idea that was accepted by much of the Orthodox world. 
who viewed it, it can't be that these secular anti-religious guys are part of the messianic redemptive process. Now, I don't want to get into my opinion on that, but this is definitely a point of discussion in the religious world. In 1904, they, they took Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, one of the most significant figures in the early state of Israel, and pre-state of Israel. He was the first Ashkenazic rabbi um, from Lithuania, tremendous Torah scholar, very mystical, really beautiful human being, tremendously profound thinker. Uh, he becomes sort of an... Uh, he becomes sort of the, the idol, the, the, the spiritual leader of the Mizrahi movement. Okay, the man who really starts to incorporate deep, profound spirituality and Jewish thought with the idea of the rebirth of the state as being part of the divine plan and part of the redemptive process. Trying to read Red Cook, by the way, is very hard. He's a very abstract thinker, very mystical. I've read his stuff in English and Hebrew. I don't know what he's talking about. But, uh, in 1921, but now he is anyone, even the most religious Jews who are not into the, the Zionist movement, they all have tremendous respect for Red Cook. He's found in 1921 Merkaz Rav Yeshiva, which becomes the seat of the religious Zionist, you know, spiritual intellectual movement, and it's still today alive and well in, in Jerusalem at the entrance to Jerusalem by Tel Aviv Highway. You can go see the yeshiva still there. Out of that, we're going to have the Mavdal, the National Religious Party is going to be formed, and after 67, out of that, we're going to get Gush Emunim, which is a movement of, of religious Zionist Jews to re to resettle in those territories, which is the heartland of biblical... We have to remember, the West Bank, we like to call it, which is where all the Arabs live, is if you look in the Bible, that's where all the biblical stories take place. Yehuda B'Shamron, that's where it all takes place. And the, the Gush Emunim, who follow this idea of the land, Eretz Yisrael Shleimah, the total land of Israel, are people who really viewed as their national mission to reestablish the land, those diehard settlers, which gets such bad PR in the Israeli press today. And that, to a large extent, they, they has politicized the religious Zionist movement. Okay, and unfortunately today, they have a lot of problems with the territory being given back. It's been a huge challenge for the Gush Emunim movement because we've retreated from that which people wanted to settle. And Anyway, it's all part and part of what's going on in this country. The splits, the schisms, there's no, there's no question that, you know, Israel's one of the few places it's hard for Jews to make money in. You know, it's just because of what goes on here and the, and the tensions in the country. And certainly, when we look at the modern state, we see there's a lot of challenges going on here. You know, economic development, Israel has now become this mini superpower, but by no means we have normal economic relations. The peace process is at best, unfortunately, we've made, we've made sort of peace with a lot of Arab countries, but in many ways it's a cold peace. If you look at what Egypt puts in their press, it's as bad as what the Nazis put in their press in the 1930s. And in many ways it's better, but in many ways we have a lot, of, there's a lot going on here. The next, you know, there's an old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, and this is certainly very interesting and difficult times for the Jewish people, what's going on today. Um, and the, the greatest danger is clearly, in my opinion, like the internal strife within the Jewish world. Can we hold the question till the end? Yeah, I just want to finish off. Um, the internal struggle clearly is the big problem of secular versus religious, which is not just the, the secular Jew looking at the religious Jew as a parasite, but the religious Jew looking at the secular Jew as a goy. And one thing we know that this is we're all in this together, and that's the biggest challenge. Everything else is a sideshow to that. I just want to end, I'm really out of time because I have to go teach another class, but just to end with a little bit of food for thought regarding uh, the future of the Jewish people and the lessons we need to learn in terms of this whole series that I've done here. We have to keep two things in mind about the survival of the Jewish people. When we look back on Jewish history, number one, we have to realize that if we are here today, it's because there's a God who acts in history. There are no accidents in Jewish history. You know, all odds <coughs> point to the fact that we should never be here. You know, I always say the person who sums up what I teach about anyone else is David Ben-Gurion, first prime minister of Israel, who's a man who was born religious, as I said before, and went off. But he said something which is fascinating. He said, a Jew who doesn't believe in miracles is not a realist. It's a great quote about Jewish history. How can he say that? If you look at Jewish history, you realize we never should have been here in the first place, and we certainly shouldn't have survived. We out-survived the greatest empires in human history. Okay, people tried to kill us. We're here, they're gone. Our ideas have changed the world. Their ideas, their culture might be around, but they're no longer there. <coughs> And that's because of two things. One is, there's a God who controls history, no question. When we look back on Jewish history, that analogy I used before, Jewish history is like a 6,000-piece puzzle. At the beginning, you dump the pieces on the table, it makes no sense. But as we get to, we only have 240 pieces left now. We just entered. This is the second day of that millennium. Not a Jewish thing. We have to realize the world is approaching. The, the non-Jewish world learned the idea of millennium from the Jew. The idea that history is moving towards a conclusion. Okay, they're expecting it because we've told the world for thousands of years that history is moving towards a destination. And now that we've put in all but 240 pieces of what seemed to be a, a puzzle that made no sense, we see that every piece fits in. There are no accidents in Jewish history. It's all part of a plan. And the other thing we have to remember is if Jewish people survived, it's not just because of a God who acts in history, but it's because we keep Judaism. 
Remember the famous quote from the Talmud? More than the Jews kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept the Jews. The great lesson of Jewish history is also the more a Jew is connected to Judaism in lifestyle, in outlook, in education, the greater the chance of having grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are Jewish. Jews who do not connect Jewishly and do not live Jewish lifestyles will not have grandchildren who are Jewish. And the reason why there are only 12 and a half to 14 million Jews in the world and not 500 million Jews in the world is to a large extent due to Jews opting out of Judaism combined with anti-Semitism. We also have to remember, by the way, that our greatest strength is our greatest weakness. What's the greatest strength of the Jewish people looking at Jewish history? The greatest strength is clearly that we are a stiff-necked people. To outlast all these empires, to live with an idea of a God, a loving God, a universal vision for humanity, has required a strength of character that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay, incredible that we are still here. We get this from Abraham, right? This great force in human history pushing us. What's the greatest weakness of the Jewish people? We are stiff-necked people. We do not bend. We break. As I said before, the hardest job on the planet Earth is to lead the Jewish people. One of the greatest challenges we have is, is bad leadership. Okay? To rule, which I said, it's easier to be the emperor of China with a billion people than to be the mayor of a town of 2,000 Jews. Every Jew thinks he's right. Every Jew knows he's the Messiah. A people like that has incredible potential when, when we're unified. But when we don't agree, we're talking about a situation. Just look at the Knesset. You can see. You can see how bad it is, how much how dangerous it is for Jews to be involved in fighting, in fighting in the Jewish people. And last but not least, we have to remember, more important than everything else, that our mission in history, we have to remember we're not just here to survive and create a national entity and to eat bagels and to get Nobel Prizes. The goal of the Jewish people from our great-grandfather, the proto-Jew Abraham onward, is that we have a mission in history. Okay, the mission is to bring the world to reality. What's that reality to God? That's the universal mission of the world living in peace and brotherhood with one God, under one God. That's the mission that Jews have given their lives for for thousands of years. That's the mission that has driven the Jew in history and enabled us to go to our death gladly, knowing that we stand for something greater than life itself. And it's the mission which has brought the whole world now, almost 4,000 years after Abraham, to the realization that we want it. The whole world is saying we want it. The problem is the world doesn't know how to actualize it. After thousands of years of telling the Jew you're out of your mind, right, from Abraham to the birth of Christianity, the world now says, you're right, there's one God, there's one standard of morality. The whole world realizes one God, no problem. And the whole world also realizes, primarily through liberal democratic ideas, that we have to have social responsibility and justice and equality, also Jewish ideas. But they don't know how to connect it together into a working model. We can't go to Miami and retire yet. We've got 240 years left to make it happen. Okay, we have to bring the world, who now understands, it's the great schizophrenia. The world understands God, they understand Benadam the Chavero, man to man, the idea of morality. We have to show how to create a working model. If we don't do that, the world will backslide. And we have to always view anti-Semitism as a revolt against Jewish ideology. But we have to get our act together. We can't, the job of perfecting the world is the collective responsibility of the entire Jewish people. And if we don't do it together, it won't get done at all. And the biggest danger is Sinat Chinam, since the beginning of the destruction of the Second Temple, of Jews hating each other. Okay, we have to remember, it's our job to do it together. United we stand, divided we fall. There's no solution to the Arab problem or any other problem we have. Throwing the Arabs out is not going to solve the problem. Got the most oft-repeated prophecy, I said it over and over again, is keep the Torah, Jewish people. Have a relationship with me, God says, and have a relationship with each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. And not just keep the nice liberal ideas, but keep kosher, keep the Sabbath. Live as a Jew fully, and I could promise you, you will live in peace, no one will bother you, and the whole world will come to learn from you. Now, I'd like to just end with a quote, which is my favorite quote. This is a little speech. This is from um, Azar Weitzman. Gave a speech. I'm sure I didn't write it, but it's a lovely speech. <laughs> to the uh, J January 16th, 1996, to both houses of parliament of Germany. Big thing. He gave it in Hebrew to the Germans after the Holocaust. But it sums up beautifully everything, I think, that really encapsulated much of what Jewish history is. And I think it's a great way to end the class. It was fate that delivered me and my contemporaries into this great era when the Jews returned to reestablish their homeland. I am no longer a wandering Jew who migrates from country to country, from exile to exile. But all Jews in every generation must regard themselves as if they have been there in previous generations, places and events. Therefore, I am still a wandering Jew, but not along the far-flung paths of the world. Now, I'm, now I migrate through the expanses of time from generation to generation down the paths of memory. I was a slave in Egypt. I received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Together with Joshua and Elijah, I crossed the Jordan River. I entered Jerusalem with David and was, and was exiled with, with Zedekiah. And I did not forget it by the rivers of Babylon. When the Lord returned the captives of Zion, I dreamed among the builders of its ramparts. 
I fought the Romans and was banished from Spain. I was bound to the stake in Mainz. I studied Torah in Yemen and lost my family in Kishinev. I was incinerated in Treblinka, rebelled in Warsaw, and emigrated to the land of Israel, the country from where I have been exiled and where I have been born and from which I come and to which I return. I am a wandering Jew who follows in the footsteps of my forebearers. And just as I, as I escort them there and now and then, so do my forebearers ac accompany me and stand with me here today. I am a wandering Jew with the cloak of memory around my shoulders and the staff of hope in my hand. I stand at the great crossroads in time at the end of the 20th century. I know whence I come, and with hope and apprehension, I attempt to find out, and apprehension, I attempt to find out where I am heading. We are all people of memory and prayer. We are people of words and hope. We have neither established empires nor built castles and palaces. We have only, we have only placed words on top of each other. We have fashioned ideas. We have built mem memorials. We have dream towers of yearning of Jerusalem rebuilt, of Jerusalem united, of a peace that will swiftly and speedily establish us in our days. Amen. And just to end with one final quote on a biblical nature, this is my major quote, which I call the whole series on Wings of Eagles. This is from Exodus 19, 4 through 5, and this is my ending piece of wisdom. This is God speaking to the Jewish people. You have seen what I did to Egypt and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own treasure from amongst all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we should all live to see the day when it comes soon, when the entire Jewish people lives again in the land of Israel, a Jerusalem rebuilt spiritually, when the whole world comes to learn from us and we truly fulfill our mission as a light unto nations. Thank you very much. You have been listening to Voices from Jerusalem. For a free cassette catalog, in the U.S. call toll-free 1-800-VOICES-3. Our email address is voices at aish.edu or write to us at P.O. Box 14149, Jerusalem, Israel. Shalom from Jerusalem.